lessons from the ongoing European debt crisis. It was easy to pick the subject a few months ago. Francesco and I thought that this would be a topical uh, you know, argument for discussion, and uh, indeed, there it is. Uh, we have uh, uh, three panelists with the strongest credentials, uh, you know, a powerful mix of uh, academic excellence and policy experience on the subject. Uh, I would like actually to, to start thanking them profusely for accepting our invitation and being here, sometimes taking time from a very busy schedule in the middle of also the teaching period. Uh, so they deserve a, a warm thanks. Uh, they need no introduction. Let me just uh, point to them. We have uh, Lorenzo Binismaghi to my right, uh, now at Harvard. He has been, as you know, in the exec member of the executive board of the ECB, long experience in, the, on, in central banking, a subject on which he has uh, written profusely, always providing an academic perspective on the policy making process, and especially challenging the academics about coming up with ideas and models for the process. And uh, to my right, Ken Rogoff uh, and uh, Guillermo Calvo, uh, I, I put them together as the two most, uh, one of the most influential macroeconomists in the last uh, decades that you know, have uh, in, uh, literally shaped our way of thinking about many, uh, many problems. Uh, both as academics and uh, for the uh, policymakers. Uh, the topic uh, discussed today will go from uh, uh, issues from the debt crisis. In particular, we are interested in knowing uh, how the events in the Europe in the last years have changed or should change the way we think about sovereign debt crisis, both uh, as applied uh, uh, you know, as both as academics and policy makers. Uh, what bit, what parts of the intellectual and, po and policy uh, toolkits we need to revise? Uh, what are the novel features that uh, uh, we face, maybe because uh, of the specific features of the economies, OECD, economies, part of the monetary union, uh, or because of fundamental changes in the way international capital markets are working. So this would be our opening salvo. And then we'll go more specific into the model of adjustment for Europe and perhaps other questions about fiscal austerity, fiscal compacts, and other emerging uh, uh, topics. Uh, the organization of the panel, we have one hour and a half. I will be strict interrupting questions when I open the floor because we want to have many questions. So please, uh, if you have... Uh, ideas or questions, keep it uh, short, uh, two, two minutes the most, so that we have uh, uh, a, a wealth of questions and answers. I will be tough on the, on the panelists too, so that uh, I'll try to keep everybody within the uh, time. We'll have uh, first uh, a couple of rounds uh, without opening the floor, and after the couple of rounds, I'll open the floor for a further questions from the audience. And, and uh, we'll go uh, Guillermo Calvo first, who is using some uh, uh, slides, and then uh, Lorenzo and Ken uh, next, and we'll have like uh, seven minutes of, of uh, an opening. I, I, will, I will try to keep you in the... <laughs> okay. What? Let me know when there are two minutes left. I'll do, I'll do that. Okay, okay so uh, our first speaker is uh, Guillermo. Thank you very much, Giancarlo. Uh, thank you for inviting me, uh, also Francesco Caselli. Um, I, this is quite challenging to uh, say in a few words what you think is essential to, to the discussion. So I had to be a little bit short, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to come back to questions uh, later on. So let me, let me make some uh, opening uh, shot uh, type of statement uh, at the very beginning. Uh, I mean, as you know, the, the, the word emerging market has become very popular, and the idea is that there are new markets there. Very few people seem to realize that that's what it meant. And uh, so if there are new markets, uh, you have to be able to model what that means. When I look at, uh, at uh, Europe, not all countries in Europe, but Europe, uh, 
as, 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 a, as an area at this point, you also find out that the financial markets have been developing and have been held the same problems, many of the same problems that were common in emerging markets. So that's why, in principle, if, you, if, I, if I want to think, if I start, if I would uh, to advise anybody to start thinking about these issues, I think it's a good uh, starting point to begin with a view that you are dealing with an area with emerging markets. And maybe you will learn something from many experiences in emerging markets, properly speaking. And one of the things that uh, is common to the, to the standard model that we use is that we assume that the markets are there. So if you start that way, there's no way you can uh, really capture the essence of the problems. So that's my main, uh, say, academic uh, message uh, to this. Now, one concept that I think is useful, uh, although it's very elusive, very uh, slippery, is the concept of liquidity, something that mainstream macro has obliterated completely. If you are familiar with the uh, mainstream, uh, say, new Keynesian models, uh, money is out there as an appendix. It's not central to, uh, uh, to the shocks that we discuss. The shocks come from the real sector, uh, not from the monetary or the financial sector. So again, if you start with those models, there is something very important missing. When I look at the, the experiences, uh, and I have to just mention this, I'm uh, happy to go back and, and, and discuss it, uh, I see the Brady bonds in 1980s as developing the bond market in emerging markets. Uh, I see the Eurozone and the creation of the, uh, of the Euro uh, as uh, creating new liquid assets. That's an issue that I don't think we focus at all because we were obsessed with the optimal currency area uh, as uh, spelled out by Mandel and many others, where the emphasis was on, on other aspects, nothing to do with the creation of money. Uh, and uh, say, uh, superficially, you realize that by inventing the euro, all of a sudden, the peseta banks, the lira banks, and the drachma banks were able to issue uh, reserve currencies to some extent. Uh, and on top of that, with the support of the uh, European Central Bank. And liquidity destruction events uh, like that is the Russian 1998 crisis, which is very, very interesting. I recommend uh, that you look at it if you haven't, because it's an accident that happens in the corner of the world and affects everybody. So it's very hard to say it's because of fiscal deficit or this or that. Maybe that has something to do with the vulnerabilities of the countries, but not necessarily by, by, uh, with, the, with, the, with the origin of the problem. And also the subprime crisis, as we all know well these days, it started at the dark corner of the world economy and spread out in ways that are not easy to uh, rationalize if you work in terms of a, a standard uh, macro model. Now, what's the evidence about liquidity creation that I can bring up? And that requires a lot more research. But, uh, and so, but we, we have to get ourselves in the mood, if you wish, of uh, thinking about liquidity creation, something that in our models, we just have M there, it's already being created. We say it's very difficult to understand, but it's out there and uh, there's no more discussion. But here, what's central is that liquidity is being created, that certain assets that were not liquid or acceptable as means of payments are being created. So what, what can I show uh, that has that characteristic that suggests that something like that is going, is going on, is that some of these flows, and we talk a lot about flows and sudden stops and so on, are actually bidirectional. You have outflows and inflows, which is typical of money. If you have money and you divide any, any area, uh, any city in two parts, you will see that money is going one way and the other constantly. So you have inflows and outflows constantly. Uh, so that is a characteristic. The other one, is that uh, the flows, both the, the net flows and the gross flows, keep increases until the crisis happens. So of course you can always rationalize that by saying that the market is deeply irrational. Well, yeah, maybe that's the explanation, maybe it's animal spirits, who knows? But, uh, but, but if you think of this as a process in which liquidity is being created, then it's quite possible that it's becoming more and more popular. Uh, but the liquidity is being created without a lender of last resort. And we know from all theory 
that if you have a situation like that, then the system is bound to have uh, uh, um, uh, attacks, uh, bank runs, and so on. I have to, to speed up because the time is running, running short. This is evidence. This is for many emerging markets. And you see the gross flows, the net flows going the same direction and increasing towards the peak where the crisis takes place and then, uh, then collapsing after what is in together. For the, for, the, for the euro, these are portfolio flows. This is when the euro is cre created. And you see the flows increasing in both directions in several countries. Uh, for uh, the current account, again, for, for here you have Spain and Italy, two problem uh, areas. You see that it's been deteriorating towards the, uh, in, in the run up of the crisis and then going back again. So, uh, so you, the system is bound to have, uh, without a lender of large resort that we didn't have, uh, to have that kind of uh, very familiar kind of uh, uh, crisis. Now, central banks, what have we seen when the, for emerging markets there was no uh, uh, global central bank available? And it took many years for these uh, markets to go back to normal. When you look at uh, the advanced countries now, you see that there was a problem, yes, around uh, Lehman, but then central banks came back very quickly. So just to show you one graph, this is a, a measure of the risk, interbank uh, risk. Uh, and you see how it shoots up, and then it comes back very, very quickly when the central banks go back into the action. So the central banks uh, play a key role here, which is what you would expect if liquidity is the problem. So, so two questions, uh, I, I, I finish in, in one minute uh, at the most or less. Uh, so the issues now that we are going to discuss here is easy money, tight fiscal, this is what we are seeing here. In, in Europe, we know we have bad experience about that in, in other countries, in Latin America particularly. But there is a big difference now, uh, something which is quite intriguing, which is that some people have been computing uh, safe assets in the world and showing that actually those safe assets have collapsed after, uh, after Lehman. This is a fall of about 30%. So what that suggests is that maybe there is a scarcity of safe assets. That's why interest rates in the US uh, and even ECB interest rates are, are very low uh, because of, of scarcity of, of those uh, uh, types of assets. So that if central banks uh, uh, are able to issue uh, those assets, uh, that may not be so inflationary as we tend to think when we don't take into account that there's been this type of crisis uh, taking place. So. Uh, so maybe there is more room for quantitative easing. Uh, there is some work that uh, Giancarlo has done now about these issues. This is the last one, I promise. Uh, and uh, tighty fiscal, I would be a little bit leery about it because uh, in a situation where you still have a credit crunch, doing, it's, it's not an aggregate demand uh, issue that I'm going to raise. If there is already credit crunch, increasing taxes to the private sector, certain sectors that don't have access to credit, uh, could uh, deteriorate to see very seriously the situation. And with this, I finish. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Already many things on the table. Uh, Lorenzo. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm squeezed between uh, two academics or three academics, so I, I, I and the first round is about um, being provocative in order for the others to answer, so I'll try to put a lot of questions to my colleagues uh, on the table and try to explain why we addressed as policymakers and as former policymakers the crisis maybe with not enough tools, not enough um, analytical tools uh, to tackle all the problems we were facing as policymakers. And I think the current policymakers also uh, uh, may not have a full understanding of the complexity uh, of what is happening in the euro area, which, by the way, is in the middle of a global financial crisis and many of the problems which uh, we had to address in the euro area were similar to problems that were faced uh, elsewhere and which were the result also of not fully understanding certain issues. Let me just give you an example. We had in the euro area parts 
uh, parts of the euro area affected by bubbles, which were the result of probably prolonged periods of very low interest rates, uh, something which we saw somewhere else, of course, around the world, which was the result probably of not fully understanding the impact of uh, protracted low interest rates and the impact on financial markets incentives, on risk-taking behavior, and so on and so forth. Since then, some literature, of course, has developed, but in the context, uh, that was certainly not, uh, not uh, fully understood. Uh, probably uh, those who were thinking about the Euro era and how it would develop thought that sooner or later some of the problems uh, deriving from lack of competitiveness of some areas, unbalanced growth, uh, and others uh, kind of disequilibria that were arising in the Euro area would lead to some problems uh, that would um, lead to some kind of smooth adjustment or long, prolonged adjustment. And not many thought that this adjustment would have to take place in an abrupt way in the middle of a global financial crisis. And on top of that, I think something which was probably underestimated is that um, Europe uh, and the Euro area remained uh, a sum of national economies, in particular for the banking system. Uh, many, many um, who look and compare the US to, to the Euro area often look at the, fiscal, uh, uh, at the fiscal side and the amortization and the absorption of shocks that goes through uh, the fiscal system and the fact that you have a federal uh, fiscal authority. And not many uh, look instead of the impact of the markets and in particular the structure of the banking system, uh, which makes it you know, the case that if, if, if a state in the US uh, goes bankrupt, the banks, uh, uh, not necessarily the banks of the state itself, and, and the, the banking system in general does not go bankrupt because there's no link between uh, the banking system and the state uh, itself for a series of reasons. And that, I think, was very much underestimated in, in, in the euro area and that was one of the hard lessons to learn. Uh, and I would like to focus mainly on the current situation ra rather than on the past the current situation, how to address the crisis, and maybe uh, go, going forward. Um, incidentally, the first years of, of EMU led to developments which were rather different from what many experienced. I remember discussing with uh, Paul Krugman, who was uh, fearful, uh, he was fearing uh, um, uh, that EMU would lead to a reduction of growth in the periphery. He was taking um, um, Finland, as the main example of, you know, of concentration of industries to in the core of the, of the system. And in fact, if you think about the crisis that uh, we had in Europe, it, it's a crisis which derived largely from too much growth, too much unbalanced growth in the periphery, in countries like Ireland, um, Spain, uh, even Greece. Unbalanced growth and excessive growth in the catching up led to an adjustment which, uh, which uh, which came at the midst of a financial crisis. So in, w when it came to managing this crisis, uh, many reactions, uh, and, you have, and you try to interpret the reaction of policymakers, many reactions were due to the lack of knowledge uh, and the lack of precedent, uh, thinking that this time was different maybe from the past. But it's true that uh, looking at Europe, uh, maybe some things are different. And let me just give you a couple of examples. One is, was the whole issue about contagion. I mean, uh, uh, clearly, contagion within the Euro area, which is something that we touch every day, when something happens in Greece, you immediately see uh, uh, spreads moving all over the, world, the place. But to what extent would a catastrophe, a localized catastrophe, spread to the rest of the Euro area? That was something very difficult to understand. And the Lehman Brothers case, of course, was uh, an example which led policymakers in Europe to be very fearful to go through an experiment like letting a bank fail or letting a country out of the euro area. So the lack of understanding of, um, and, and uh, from that point of view, I don't think the academic world uh, really helped us uh, very much because it's, it, these uh, markets in which we're living in are just so complicated. And you ha always have to remember that policymakers have to take a decision in one way or the other. So uh, if they don't take a decision, by definition, they take a decision. So uh, the alternative has always to be, to be weighted. So the, the, one of the problems have been the understanding of 
how financial markets work and how contagion spreads from one case to the other. The, another difficulty uh, uh, in addressing the issue, in particular in Europe, and I think that was one of the problems in our discussion with uh, many academics, is that they looked very often at the experience in uh, Amer Latin America, the Latin American debt crisis, and how that was solved through the Brady's bonds and other type of uh, measures, which were substantially different actually from what happens uh, from the situation in Europe, because in Europe, large parts of the debt is held within countries. So restructuring the debt uh, or even defaulting or even in some cases changing the currency regime has an impact on the country itself, more importantly maybe than the countries outside. So the problem of Greece, for instance, and the problem of excess debt of Greece was not so much a problem of German banks or French banks or other banks. It was a problem of the Greek banks and the Greek society, and do we want to risk having a major uh, economic and social collapse in Greece? And that was another concern that policymakers had, which they didn't really know how to address because there were no precedent. And of course, people looked at Argentina, but the analogy between Argentina and uh, Greece did not always hold. The other difficulty, of course, is to have a major crisis in an advanced economy uh, in a democracy in which many people um, understand the problem only when they see the crisis looming. And in the Euro area, probably the crisis was perceived and seen by the people much more quickly in Athens, in, 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 uh, in uh, Rome or Madrid than in Berlin, because the economy was much better. So the understanding of the type of measures which were needed uh, was, was much more difficult. And that's a novelty, because we are used to think about managing crises within political entities where creditors and debtors have the similar perception of the problem, which was not the case in Europe, where clearly creditors and debtors have a different, had a different perception because the underlying economic situation in their own uh, place was different. So going forward, uh, there are still many issues I think that policymakers uh, need to tackle without maybe having uh, many uh, clear answers. One of them is uh, the balance, for instance, between fiscal austerity and monetary uh, expansion. I think Guillermo mentioned this, but we are uh, discussing issues uh, which seem to imply that multipliers uh, are bigger than one, uh, in the sense that the fiscal tightening leads to increase in the debt to GDP ratio. And that's not what, at least I, I learned in the textbook, at least uh, in, in in, in, in closed economies like the euro area is. Um, and that's, that's one of the problems, I think, on which we need to a better understanding. Clearly, it's easier if you devalue, but even without devaluation, the balance between fiscal and monetary should entail uh, some kind of restriction if you want to adjust, especially if you have lost market access. One, one second. Um, the same for um, monetary policy. I think there is a, an understanding of the interaction between monetary and fiscal in institutional terms. That is the, the, the impact of uh, moral hazard. The more the monetary policy does, the more it takes away the pressure from the fiscal to do the kind of adjustment it needs to take to achieve the kind of sustainable uh, equilibrium. And that's another very complex uh, uh, debate and discussions uh, that uh, policymakers have to solve. Final issue that I think in my view is underestimated both by policymakers and academics in Europe is the role of banking. As long as banking will remain national, uh, uh, it will be very difficult for monetary policy to address some of the issues that Guillermo uh, mentioned already, that is to really implement a single monetary policy which produces its impact on the economy because of the credit risk which is, uh, is, uh, is there because of the national supervision, because of the uh, national taxpayers which are ultimately responsible for national supervision. So that's another complexity in Europe that we need to tackle also through better ideas uh, of how to solve some of the problems. Thank you. Can you get this? Uh, I think I have you, you get it. I don't know. Can you hear, hear me out of, yeah, yeah this microphone's working. Anyway. Um, Pleasure to be here in uh, Cambridge and to speak on this august panel on this interesting topic. I I'm not going to start out on the conjunctural issues. I want to focus in on the academic question of 
is there a theory of the optimum currency area? I have Mundell's paper here. It's called Theory of Optimum Currency Areas. And often I saw in the, in the academic literature and others, does this region meet the criteria of an optimum currency area? And I would say that, in fact, there's certainly no consensus theory. There are a lot of interesting work. This isn't something that's been molded, that's been developed to the point where there's any kind of consensus on what those criteria should be. And just to follow the intellectual history, the Mandel paper, uh, in many ways, and even if you read it carefully, talks about having an optimum currency area, not just about reforming currency areas, but a way to think about exchange rate regimes. It was very fresh, a little bit impish, but very fresh way of looking at things to sort of, well, if you really think stabilization's at the core of it, why are you drawing the line at countries? Maybe it should be regions within countries. Maybe it should be across countries. And it has a very eloquent uh, discussion of uh, stabilization issues on employment and inflation, which actually has a very modern tone to it. It's really qu uh, quite remarkable in that respect. Uh, by the way, the idea of labor mobility, which is the one criteria that he really has in it, Actually, he cites Mead and Skotovsky for saying that. Uh, of course, uh, I was a Rudy Dornbush student who emphasized to me that everything is in Mead. It's just you can't understand it. Uh, and so uh, Mundell says the problem with Mead is he takes it too literally. It's not something that's absolute. And he looks at adjustment uh, mechanisms. But there's nothing there. It came later on a lot of other issues, uh, Peter Kennan, uh, maybe eight or ten years later, brought in the idea that there's no risk-sharing adjustment mechanism. If you don't have a common uh, government, you need some mechanism for fiscal transfer. Kennan really didn't take up the point that if the fiscal transfers are big, you need political legitimacy across the union to decide who's going to make those fiscal transfers. Uh, others talked about uh, further issues, just to name a couple. Uh, Obsfeld, in his uh, Graham lecture, maybe 20 years after that, uh, talks about the lender of last resort. And he, by the way, mentions that Garber and Fokert Landau had said something about that earlier as well. Although he's talking about lender of last resort for, for private institutions, not necessarily for governments. Lorenzo talked about regulation. That's clearly something very, very important, having uh, uh, common regulation. We had an empirical literature trying to play out with, uh, sort out these very basic ideas. Uh, for example, uh, Sachs and Sully Martin had an estimate about how important fiscal transfers were within the United States as a burden, a, a risk absorbing mechanism. I, I must say one of the answers that my, some of my European colleagues who were somewhat evangelical about the Euro because of uh, the spiritual ideas that under, underlie it say that, well, that, that's OK. We can do that with capital markets. They can provide the cushioning. Well, OK, that's another criteria. You could have really, really developed uh, capital markets, uh, and then you can decide if we do. Uh, there's a, a, a very fine piece of empirical work was by the European Commission, this book you probably heard of but maybe not looked at, many of you called One Market, uh, One Money. It's a, it is a very fine piece of work looking at the state of the art in each of these things. But, but actually, <laughs> they can't come up with much. They've been set on the task of finding an empirically important reason within what they can find from the optimum uh, currency area literature. And the biggest thing in it is that they say, well, it's expensive to do accounting in different currencies. Of course, nowadays, that you just push a button, and that's really not an issue. Uh, coming back to these ideas, you know, these intermediate ideas of what does labor, if it's labor mobility, what is that? Does that mean everyone's a citizen of Europe? They can go anywhere they want, take any transfers they want? Are we talking about China, where I'm not going to pronounce it right, but you need a haku to you know, go to the city and work, except your kids can't get educated and you can't get health care? What does it mean, labor mobility? What exactly do we mean by that? 
So I wouldn't say that we don't have a literature. There's wonderful papers on this, but uh, you know, looking from the very theoretical to the more empirical, but there certainly wasn't a consensus. Now I think maybe everyone knows that, but if you, you know, if you ask uh, where did it stand in the economic community on should we, you know, have a single currency, are we ready for that? I, I would have said looking at Europe, there was a big literature and the overwhelming answer was no that it's premature, at least on that broad a scale with that many countries. And I, 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 this is also a forward-looking uh, comment of, of the challenges ahead. And just a couple more points. I mean, the debt crisis, I think uh, Guillermo made a very good point that there's a way in which it's a lot like an emerging market debt crisis. In fact, I'd say it's a lot like an exchange rate-based stabilization program. Works for many years. Uh, interest rates come down, big private credit boom, boom blows up. I mean, it looks an awful lot like that so far. I mean, a different end game, perhaps, because the exchange rate can't depreciate. Um, and you know, at the, at, at, at the same time, it's true what Lorenzo said, that uh, the, the financial crisis, which started in the United States, really shook things up. Europe, Europe didn't get time to mature. On the other hand, a system has to be robust. Stuff happens. You can't set up a system that only works if nothing happens. And, and you know, if it's a, it's a, it's a calm year. And I, <clears throat> if we think about the system going forward, uh, I, I would say, just to be provocative, I mean, you could throw out the periphery countries, not that that's going to happen necessarily, but you could throw them out, have France and Germany, if they don't form more of a political union, much more of a political union than they have with a real uh, finance ministry that, create, that, that has the right to take in a lot of taxes. They have voting for people they actually you know, care about as being the leaders of Europe. There'll be other problems, really, in the next 20 years, and it will not survive if they don't do that. I, I think Mundell laid out this very interesting and provocative question. I think uh, Oh, it, it, it clearly, he, he, he brought in the idea that a lot of things are in flux. We need to you know, show the economic side of it. But I think it's very clear that there are these other elements on the political side that require more than, uh, more than we have at the moment. And uh, that's, I think, the challenge going forward. Very good, thank you. Very good, thank you so much. There is uh, quite a bit of material on the table, so let me start eliciting some uh, reaction uh, immediately uh, before uh, uh, going later to a broader audience. Uh, um, there is a small question, which is uh, in the analogy with the emerging market crisis and the European crisis, there is one aspect that is uh, interesting, the fact that uh, European markets, European countries have an original sin. They issue that in euros. Uh, it's no longer, you know, it's basically a foreign currency from the perspective of each uh, country. But there is no balance of payment uh, constraint, literally so, because of the uh, ECB, basically uh, as a byproduct of the ECB financing uh, the interbank market. So I wonder whether you want to comment on that particular difference in, the, in, in, the, in terms. Should, do you want the questions all up front? Or would you prefer to go? You're the moderator. I am the moderator. So <laughs> l l let me pick up so on this small question yeah. before we go to the big questions that Ken uh, at, this, uh, at the end uh, raised. Yeah, and, and uh, you're exactly right that uh, the emerging markets uh, face a balance of payment problem because they didn't have a lender of last resort. Uh, that came forward so quickly. Uh, although they had some help for, from, uh, from uh, the IMF and institutions of that sort, but it was not the lender of last resort type of help. It just came when the crisis was really um, very serious. Uh, now, that different in a certain way helped these uh, countries to solve the, the crisis uh, in a more uh, swifty uh, 
uh, way because there was nothing they could do. The government was part of the problem. So they had to abandon the system. And as a result, the exchange rate went up. Inflation uh, 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 went through the roof. And that helped to solve certain domestic problems, like real wages, for example, fell like a rock. So it's not good news for the workers, certainly, but, it, but uh, from that point of view, but uh, from the point of view of uh, fiscal accounts, for example, the adjustment was uh, very, very quick. The disadvantage was uh, not having uh, a, a lender of last resort, but uh, that helped to also take care of uh, uh, social benefits, for example, uh, that uh, uh, inflation just uh, liquidated uh, very quickly. Let me, let me make, uh, so inflation, and the inevitability of inflation, I think, uh, tend to solve the problem. Uh, certainly, uh, they, they have this uh, original sin problem, which is the one you mentioned about uh, uh, debt being denominated in a, in a foreign currency. But after you, the, after a big devaluation, it becomes much easier to argue that you cannot pay back. So for some countries, it was obvious, I mean, Argentina 2001, that there was no way you could enforce that, uh, especially because there were many domestic debts denominated in, in foreign exchange. So the big mess, in a certain sense, helped to uh, you know, focus on on a couple of things and get going. And actually, Argentina, since I mentioned it, was able to recover without credit. Uh, actually, with a balance of payment, with current, positive current account all along, and it went back through a very speedy recovery for other reasons too. And to mention another difference with that I, I, I end is that uh, when you look at the emerging market, part of the recovery of these countries was helped because of the big devaluation. But they were facing a world, the rest of the world was advanced countries that went through a period of relative uh, boom, uh, great moderation and so on. So they could hitchhike on the rest of the world. And in our sample, for example, exports increased after the crisis by about 25%. When you look at that in Europe or in the US, exports are basically flat. There is a, a very nice paper that uh, Ken Robert and Mario Opselt wrote some time ago linking the adjustment problem to the insularity, economic uh, insular economies, I guess you remember, uh, in which basically, if I remember correctly, the issue of uh, smooth adjustment to shocks uh, becomes less and less, no, smooth adjustment to shocks becomes less and less likely the more economies have, uh, uh, you know, faulty lines between them that can be for jurisdiction. Uh, so I actually would like to throw back uh, this question to both of you, which is, uh, uh, I guess, you know, you have a skeptical view about the survival of the euro, or, but uh, before that, there is a question of how, which aspect of insularity is going to play a major role now, and what kind of adjustment one can think it may happen in the next uh, yeah, I, I wanted to come back to some of the questions that Ken uh, posed to explain how easier it is uh, to be an academic than a policymaker in the sense that uh, he, uh, um, because he asked, you know, uh, is the euro area an optimal currency area? And he said the overwhelming uh, literature led to the conclusion that it is not. And probably most people would agree, but that's not the question policymakers ask. The policymakers ask, what is not an optimal, but a sustainable uh, uh, exchange rate or monetary regime for Europe. Uh, so they not, cannot look only for the optimal, they have to do something concrete in reality. And um, they went through the history and after the Bretton Woods uh, crisis, they tried to do things and clearly a fully floating exchange rate regime was not optimal uh, either. And what probably was less optimal. That, so, so they went to trying to reduce volatility through this exchange rate mechanism which were not optimal also in, if you want to liberalize capital movement. So the choice of a policymaker is, is much more complicated it's for second or third best. And clearly, crises come and, uh, and show that it's not optimal, but maybe it's less worse than others. But then I agree with him that in order to make it a bit more optimal or a bit more sustainable or closer to the optimal, you need to do things. 
And it's clear that the euro was born on the assumption that first, the only possible crisis would come from the fiscal instead of the real economy. And maybe as basically assuming that there would be no crisis. So the crisis came and you had to start fixing things in a quite cumbersome way. And it's true that in order to fix things, you need the political integration. And unless there is a willingness to take some political decisions, in particular to redistribute income and to, to create a shop absorber, you, um, you, you will fail. So the key test is whether Europe is willing to take the kind of political decisions uh, in order to fix the problems. But that's what happened in the US also. And uh, to some extent, uh, when you say, why don't you throw uh, some countries out, it will make uh, life easier. Uh, I don't know how things were addressed in the, 18th, uh, in the 19th century in the US, whether they were thinking about throwing away Carolina or other uh, states. But uh, it, it strikes me that, for instance, uh, the Fed that was created only in 1914. So the, the, you had a monetary union without a central bank. Now today, people would say this is crazy. But the learning by doing process is part of the building up of institutions. And I think we have to realize in Europe that that's part of, um, of what we're trying to do, to learn by mistakes. And of course, we could be quicker. I would agree with that. Uh, but uh, without making the mistakes, people don't understand why you need to do certain things. I mean, some people in the US are putting into question the same existence of the Fed uh, more than nearly 100 years after, um, which shows how complex it is to build political consensus uh, around institution. But I think that's the kind of exercise we are doing many, many years after, and you need crisis. I think they created the Fed after a few banking crises in the US, and they realize, of course, that you need a lender of last resort. And that's the same thing we are, we are trying to do here. And uh, what I consider, just to conclude, uh, important is that ultimately the political will to do these things comes ultimately from the people and the people on the ground. And the fact that the Greeks ultimately have uh, voted um, time after time, very late, of course, in, with the uh, a very complicated process, but they voted to stay in the euro, is, uh, um, is a testimony of this willingness to, to progress. So I would be a bit more optimistic about the fact that uh, we are trying to do something similar to what the US did uh, 200 years ago in a different way, of course, because crises are different and are much more complicated to solve. I guess, can you well like to... Yeah, I, 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 provocative I, enough, uh, Ken. <laughs> Well, I mean, one obvious thing is I, I think that Europe's not nearly there on its political integration, and you're inviting the retort that a much bigger crisis must be coming so that you can have the political union that ultimately would make it stable with either the whole or some subset of states. I want to make one other backward-looking comment, which is one of the reasons the euro was formed was a dissatisfaction with exchange rate volatility, which policymakers never like. But it was also inflation and a feeling, as particularly in Italy and in France, we haven't figured out what to do infl with inflation. The Germans sure seem to have done it. Why don't we just tie ourselves to them? And that was the transition. The truth of the matter is, is I think the advent of independent central banking went a long ways towards solving that problem everywhere. And had Europe not adopted the euro, but had gone in this other institutional direction, I don't think you'd have high inflation in Italy or France today uh, without the euro. Uh, and, of, and, and of course, uh, there is the question of uh, the political side of it, that European, uh, the, the common market is a a great idea, at least you know, up to a point, and to the extent the euro helped catalyze that, that's fine. But you know, part of the reason Greece is so enthusiastic about staying in the euro is it's sort of subtly threatened with being thrown out of the European Union if it leaves the euro, which doesn't need to be the same question. But I mean, apart from optimality or sustainability, the, you know, there is a, a practical question now that. Uh, uh, the euro was conceived as, uh, you know, a, a way towards uh, some stronger integration. Uh, that was uh, at one point question. There was a debate in the ECB. You know, yeah. Otmar Issy would say, why do we need the, poli you know, what no, but, is the minimum yeah. constitutional? But if I can say, you have to go to the people, because ultimately it's the citizens who decide. And when... Um,
you tell the people, we need to create monetary union because we have problems in the exchange rate volatility and so forth. In the end, they said, yes, we understand this, okay. If at the same time you would have said that we need also fiscal union, most of the people would have said, why do we need that? What kind of problems are we solving? Then Ken would say, yeah, but if you don't do that, once you have a crisis, you will get into trouble. But most people would say, well, let's see, maybe, maybe not. Now we have a crisis, and, uh, and you go to Germany, and you see several people in Germany who say, well, maybe we have to think about euro bonds, we have to think about transfers. You know, we have a problem to solve, and you know, let's solve it. I think that's the way our democracies uh, work. Uh, uh, they have to see the problems uh, in order to solve them. Uh, most people didn't think about TARP before the crisis. Uh, they voted TARP, by the way, I think they, 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 they eliminated now the possibility to make it so easy for the future because also in the US people don't uh, trust politicians. But, but I, I think that's the way our democracies solve problems. They need to see the problem, they need to see the alternative, which is probably disastrous, and then they are convinced to take the unpalatable decisions which, which are taken in a very cumbersome way, but that's, that's the way I, I see the progress towards this kind of political union, which is, which is difficult, but it's happening. Yeah, no, I, I see a parallel uh, between Europe, this type of discussion, and uh, emerging markets. Uh, in emerging markets, there was the issue of sequencing, what to open first, the trade account or the, or the capital account. Uh, more in general, should you uh, uh, have a free uh, financial system if you still have problems in the commercial arena, say, in the, in the real part of the economy? And, uh, and uh, the, 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 the experience there was uh, very much against opening uh, the financial account first and then uh, try to, with that, that was a hope for a while, going, looking back to the 1980s, there was a hope that by opening up the, the capital account completely, then that would sort of discipline the real side of the economy and politicians, and then they will open up the rest of the economy. Well, that was much more trickier than, than, than they thought. Now, the lesson that was learned from that is that if you're going to liberalize the financial system, which is what Argentina did uh, uh, beginning in 2001, then you have to be very careful with the financial system and subject your banks to very strict uh, regulations. And that they did, actually. Uh, uh, this is not the place to discuss the case of Argentina that went out of the system very badly, but not because of lack of uh, regulation of the banking system. There was other problems uh, on top of that. And, uh, and when you look at the recent Lehman uh, episode, for example, and you examine uh, these countries, many of which are somewhat paid to the dollar, what they have done after the crisis that they subjected the, 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 the uh, banks to much stricter conditions. So you find very few banks in the region that had toxic assets. And consequently, they could recover. They're actually booming these days for other reasons too. But uh, maybe if there is a lesson that uh, I would draw from that is that to the extent that you don't have the real side, including the fiscal, political arrangement, etc., maybe you cannot af afford to have a, a very free financial system. Maybe reserve requirements should be higher. Maybe banks should be subject to much stricter rules. That has all kinds of problems because you have the U.S. on the other side and you may lose competitiveness in the financial sector, but maybe that's the price to pay. It may take just a, a minute. If you look at 92, 93, the largest, uh, the last but one crisis in Europe, there are remarkable similarities to today. We have a growing imbalance over time, a common shock at the time was the German unification, uh, a mess for many months, maybe perhaps two years. And then it was, uh, the exit was uh, basically coincided with uh, a new uh, macro framework or institutional framework this country went for inflation targeting together with Sweden. The others went for the euro with the growth and stability pact, basically reinforced there. Uh, what do you think it would be the, the way forward? I mean, you have been talking about sabbatical from the euro. Uh, or What would be the, the new macro framework? Do you think it is also like an implicit question about the, the, the fiscal compact, I guess, on this? Uh, 
what is the hope for Europe to go ahead in the process of you know maintaining the, the, the single market, the maintaining an area of economic prosperity? In my view, what's, um, what's missing in the current discussion is a recognition that the imbalances were ma mainly due to private sector, and in particular the fact that banks, the banking systems have remained national. And um, in my view, if we want to move forward uh, with a better functioning monetary union and economic union, we need a European banking system. As long as we'll have a national banking system, uh, national shocks will become capital account shocks, not only current account shocks, and it will make it much more difficult to finance them. And in order to, to have a, a, a European banking system, you need a European supervisory system, and you need a European bank resolution system, or at least within the euro area. And that's an issue on, on which I, I would like to see also more work in the academic sector, the link between monetary and banking and how complementary they are. So that's, I think, the, the progress we need to make because the fiscal compact is only one dimension of it and it's basically a, a strengthening of the previous stability and growth pact. But we are missing the, you know, what makes the capital account work better. I think Ken said uh, that the evangelicals were answering uh, uh, to the shock absorber uh, question we will have the capital markets uh, uh, absorb the shock affecting one part of, of the euro area. The point is that we all assume that capital markets always work. And we realize in this crisis that capital markets sometimes don't work. And so we need to fix that in, in, in the euro area. We went down every round. <laughs> Can we do it? Well, first I'd second what Guillermo said. Uh, I think it may well be that, you know, in the foreseeable future, uh, Europe's going to have to rein in its capital markets in, or in order to preserve the euro. I don't know that that's a good trade, by the way. Um, you know, that, that it depends on how far you have to go. That's a question. It certainly wasn't raised in the optimal currency union literature much till now. Uh, so, I, you know, I think that's, uh, that's an important uh, question. But if you, if you go to talking about having a euro bond, if you talk about going to have a euro banking system, it's very hard to do this in a sustainable way without political legitimacy following. I don't see how you can keep 17 independent countries the way they are without having a significantly closer federation than what's talked about now, I mean, with the fiscal rules and such, which the, the, the Maastricht Treaty, it's sort of the, the Maastricht Treaty reinforced. And the Maastricht Treaty is very clever, although unfortunately it didn't look at the uh, private debt. It only looked at the public debt. And the private debt often implicitly becomes public. And maybe having a European banking system would be a step towards that. But, um, you know, I, I, I just don't see robustness in this system without going one way or the other. If I could take another minute, one of my, my favorite analogies for this whole thing, and forgive me that this is too extreme, but if you have a couple, they can't decide whether they're going to want to get married or not. So they say, let's open a checking account together to see how it works. And actually, it doesn't work so bad. So they say, well, how about my brother and your sister share the checking account? And that works. And then they start bringing in second cousins, third cousins they've never met. Uh, and well, you know, and maybe they ultimately have to, ultimately have to get married because of all the lawsuits against the two of them. But it's, it's very much an, ex you know, that's extreme, but it's an experiment like this saying, you know, we do this, there's no choice but to get married ultimately. We want to go to political union, which is part of, part of the project. But that has to come, and I, I, I agree. You need crisis to force the public to want that, if they want that, Britain opted out when they had the, at least for for a long time when they had their crisis. But I, it's it, coming back to the Mundell article that I brought, a theory of optimum currency areas. He poses the question: Does the currency have to have anything to do with the national border? And I think that we're filling in the answer to that, which is a resounding yes. Just to try to even the, the, the playing field, 
if you start from the other end, floating exchange rate, that's also very risky. I mean, we are looking at the experiences, recent experiences of the Swiss franc and the Norwegian uh, Krone. And that led me to take a look at what happens in uh, reserve currencies. Uh, if you, at present, um, international reserves uh, uh, around the world represent around 30% of uh, M2 supply in Europe and in the United States. And even a large share of the short-term debt in, in, in those countries. Uh, so there is a new player in the world, the central banks, and we have not factored that in. And the central bank is a completely different player, and they have people who will reshuffle the currencies uh, for, for purely financial, financial reasons. So there could be, I, I don't know, if we break up the union, uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, there could be a sudden switch in favor of the, of the new euro and therefore a tremendous appreciation and maybe the others will sort of uh, shadow the, the new euro. So you may end up having a system that since we are dealing with money and we know that from first principles that money in principle have no fundamental behind so you need some, something to, to keep them uh, anchored. So if we just say we just break up this union and let uh, some of them go we, without an anchor, and we won't have an anchor in the short run because we don't know what, how the new system works, you can have a lot of uh, non-fundamental, let me call it that way, uh, volatility that may lead to repegging and it may lead to all kinds of uh, problems having to do with the real sector. So I'm a little bit weary about uh, taking this uh, sabbatical. I, 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 oh, I mean, I'm certainly not advocating the euro break up. I'm making the point that if it's going to, we're not going to have like a much worse crisis, you have to go forward to a much deeper union. Now, within that context, when you think of a much deeper union, I think it does raise the question of how expansive it should be a political decision. It's a cost-benefit uh, thing. Uh, but that question's been carefully kept from the public because they don't want to, particularly in the northern European countries, don't really want to think about the fact that they may need to allow much more fiscal transfers, more labor mobility, more governance sharing, that they're not, they don't want that. And yet, they may not, it may not have a choice. I, I don't know. Very good. So we had uh, uh, comments for a shadow in uh, some radical rethinking of European policies, uh, from uh, financial market to the say, very institutions of the euro. We have now half an hour for uh, open questions. Uh, there should be microphones somewhere. And I'll ask everybody to be extremely short so that uh, we can uh, uh, collect a number of questions. I can hardly see. I wonder whether you could have some more light in the audience so I can see people raising their hands. Okay. Oh, this is fair. Oh, here. Francesco Caselli. Uh, thanks. <coughs> Quick question on um, the optimal currency area uh, issue. I think the statement that the euro area is not an optimal currency area is very hard to uh, deny and, and to debate. So I think we have pretty much all agree on that. But I wanted to probe uh, the further statement, which I think was, was implicit in some of the comments, that um, the Greek crisis, which is the, where, the, where the crisis started, is a direct consequence of the failure of the criteria of the optimal currency area. Sorry, I, I can see from your face that you cannot quite hear me. Is that correct? statement, the implicit statement that the crisis, the debt crisis in Greece is stems from failing to meet the criteria of the optimal currency area. Um, if you look at just the sequence of events, uh, you have a government that for about 10 years can borrow at the same rates as the German government. And I think we can all agree that had interest rates 
been higher, uh, we would probably have seen a more sustainable fiscal behavior in Greece. So then the question becomes why were interest rates so low uh, in, in Greece over this period? And I think the inevitable answer is that markets were assuming that there would be a bailout uh, in case of a, of a crisis. Uh, so nothing to do with too much to do with the standard criterion of optical currency areas. It's more about market formula expectation and this expectation then not being uh, realized exposed. Um, so the, the obvious question is uh, what, what would have happened? Where would we be now if it had been possible to credibly signal to markets that uh, the bailouts were not to be expected in case of crisis? Yes, yeah, so um, just going back to, in a sense, what policy is now, um, Glenbrook Alva did mention the, the, the current policy of fiscal tightness and lots of money printing historically hasn't had a great results, but that does seem to be what everyone's doing, not just in Europe, but in the US and in the UK. So just wondering maybe if, one, if you'd care to comment a bit more on that, but also, experience in emerging markets from the Bradys, uh, Russia, uh, one could argue Iceland, not so much emerging market, or may, might be again at the moment, um, is that default does work? And shouldn't, for, shouldn't that be maybe encouraged with Portugal and Italy and Spain and so forth as a way to resolve the crisis at the moment? Do you, do you hear me? Can you hear me? No. Do you, do you hear me loud and clear? Yeah. Very uh, the question is, as, as um, an attempt to solve the liquidity problem, the European Central Bank, like the Federal Reserve in the US, have uh, severely expanded the monetary base. Could you comment on, could you comment on the way out how would the European Central Bank, and eventually the, the Federal Reserve, reabsorb that expansion of the monetary base without raising interest rates? Start from the point that uh, low inflation and zero growth is far from being an optimal situation. Given this, I wonder to what extent Europe must still uh, understand that uh, public debt is not so different from private debt in a fully integrated market, so that uh, the idea of uh, bailing out national governments uh, that are indebted uh, should be discarded and uh, in order to remove the constraints that today forces government uh, to apply hyper austerity which leads in my opinion to self-defeating self zero growth accepting the idea that uh, one public body can issue bonds that are not safe by definition, but they have, they have some degree of risk, much like any other private issuer, could be an element that helps governments and even central bank to accept the idea that uh, the market is integrated, but this does not mean that uh, there is a unique interest rate applied to everybody, because the riskier issuer has to pay higher interest rates. Questions? Anybody wish to go first? <laughs> 
five ten. I can. Why don't I take up a couple, and yeah. then I could come back. Um, so Francesco uh, asked, "What does Greece's problem have to do with the euro?" And to, to a first approximation, it's just your basic exchange rate based stabilization problem. They could have had their own central bank pegged at the euro. Interest rates come down. They borrow like crazy. It looks like 25 other countries, and it blows up. Very common pattern, as Guillermo highlighted in this discussion. Uh, of course, it's in the end game that you have the problem. There are differences. So there's, of course, no exchange rate to depreciate to create competitiveness, which is the normal way out of this. And I think that is a huge question lurking over Europe. And it doesn't just have to do with debt. It has to do with global forces, with Asia and other things that have created a very uncompetitive periphery where wages need to adjust or labor needs to be mobile or something. And the, I, I think the size of the wage adjustments needed are profound in uh, some of the periphery countries. Uh, it has to do with the fact that there's a bigger bludgeon that Greece can be hit with because it can be kicked out of the European Union, which is a huge penalty. And when we study sovereign default, which uh, I think we understand a little better than optimum currency unions, uh, that, that isn't usually there in the same way. You can't really credibly threaten to cut a country off from trade in a big way. And then finally, I can't remember if it was uh, Guillermo or Lorenzo that mentioned it, there's the contagion issue because there's always contagion when if Argentina defaults, there's always contagion, but it's much more because there's so much symmetry across the problems that countries face. Uh, Portugal faces very similar problems to Greece, less extreme, but very similar. If you look at the benchmarks that Carmen Reinhardt and I look at of external debt, public debt, Portugal looks good only next to Greece. I mean, it doesn't look good by historical standards. And some of the other European countries uh, don't, don't uh, look so well uh, either. Um, oh, there was a question about does default work? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think there's clearly going to be default here. And how much it's swept under the table, it's done through financial repression and behind the scenes taxes, how much of it is outright restructuring remains to be seen. And it's different in different situations. But certainly, if you don't do outright restructuring and get it over with quickly some way, this is going to be painful for a long, long time. Can if I just ask a, a small adding question? Do you see the fault uh, uh, more frequent besides the euro? I mean, one of, one of the, 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 more, more the, frequent. The, gifts, the gifts from the crisis is the fact that we have an increase in public liabilities, explicit and contingent uh, worldwide. So this is the full question. Would, would the fault be a, a less uh, pathological, extreme uh, situation, apart from the euro? It, because that is an answer. I mean, if the United States would default, it would be fantastic for the sales of our book. But I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't think it would be. Uh, I don't think it would, I don't think it's particularly likely. I mean, there was a technical default for sure in the 1933, by the way, which is sort of written out of the history books to some extent. But if you're looking at the big countries, what Carmen and I find in our work and our continuing work, and I guess she spoke here recently, is slow growth happens uh, after, afterwards when debt gets these high levels. The, but there, there's a lot of countries besides the big countries and where uh, debt is high. So I certainly don't think we're done with seeing sovereign defaults here. But, but would you see like a sovereign, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, Financial repression then as uh, I, 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 that's the, a long tangent, but I, I think in the uh, big countries the most likely thing is a long period of slow growth with a mix of different uh, half baked approaches to it. Maybe on there's a, there was a question on the ECB. Well, at least one of the issues of the papers that uh, I found uh, helpful during the crisis is a pool paper, uh, 1960, I don't know what, 68, 69. I think it helps understanding why central banks have to expand the balance sheet when you have a portfolio shift like the one uh, we experienced. Um, how difficult it's going to be to reabsorb uh, liquidity? In theory, it's not so complicated. You just have to issue paper to reabsorb uh, um, the liquidity, to some extent, in the ECB case, uh, given that the liquidity is provided on demand by the banks, uh, the banks will, as the economy improves and as the 
portfolio shift uh, goes back towards risky assets, then there will be less demand for central bank money, and this will help reabsorb uh, the excess liquidity. Uh, the question was, can you reabsorb without increasing rates? Why don't you need to increase rates? At a certain point, there will be the need to increase rates, and this will contribute to reabsorb uh, the excess liquidity. So I, I don't see uh, a problem with having uh, both. Um, on, on the issue of um, who, who should assess the viability of, uh, and the risk of public debt, I, I think that we, have, um, we wanted a system in which markets would play a role in assessing a, a national debt risk. Uh, and it didn't work. And I don't think it, it will work. And I don't think it would be a system which is sustainable in political terms. Uh, I think in the end, if we want to move towards greater political integration, I don't think we can let to the markets uh, uh, the burden of assessing whether the debt is sustained, of a country is sustainable or not. I think it has to be the task of the political authorities, and that's what they have not fully understood yet. They have not understood that finance ministers, when they sit at the table, they don't have only to defend their own fiscal position, they have to make sure that the fiscal position of the others uh, matters and they have to act in a way that, that uh, uh, can change the fiscal policy of the other members of the union if needed. And when they started uh, not to do that anymore, in particular in 2003, when uh, European finance ministers decided to accept uh, some leeway for Germany and France, then they stopped to um, provide this kind of fiscal discipline which is necessary uh, uh, when the crisis comes to then provide financial assistance because uh, ultimately and that's the difference with emerging markets I, I try to understand if a government defaults uh, the, 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 the debt of somebody is an asset of somebody else and in our economies the assets are largely held by the banking system and by residents so a default uh, in 1980 by by, by Latin America was a problem of American banks. It was not a big problem for, for the Latin American countries, except for the, uh, to some extent, the contagion and except from the loss of market access for a few years. But the, the wealth effect was largely in the US and that was dealt with uh, through forbearance and other special issues. In the case of Greece, we have seen that part of the savings that was achieved by through the haircut of the debt, had to be compensated by new capital inject, huge capital injection to avoid the collapse of the financial system in Greece. And the same would happen, of course, in other countries. So um, the redistributive effect that you have through uh, a massive devastating impact uh, of, a, of a default is, is really something that uh, will have a, a real economy impact. So, I agree with Ken, we will have low growth in order to absorb, but the alternative of default, if it is a hard default, could be even more devastating. And um, I, I don't know to what extent you, I, I haven't read that in your book, but what is the political implication of default and, and, and the social implication of default? It's something which I, in my view is very interesting. I don't know how many democracies survived defaults. Uh, uh, not, not, maybe not that many. I mean, defaults like the ones uh, that, that that we will really need to, to, to cut the debt. So the issue goes a bit beyond economics, uh, uh, in my view. If you, if you, if you have a, a major social and political disruption in Europe, then uh, I think we are facing something totally different that we have really to think uh, seriously about. Yeah, I, I agree very much with the point that Lorenzo made about uh, the financial system being uh, the responsibility of everybody in the union in any union, and, uh, and uh, uh, what I would like to point out is that uh, uh, maybe something that we should convey to the politicians uh, is that, and that part of the over-indebtedness problems that we are facing now are partly due to the fact that they, they liberalized the financial system, they didn't realize, they, we, everybody, uh, mostly uh, did not realize that we were creating a, a, a monster uh, 
uh, that capital was going to Spain and Ireland and, and other countries that are in big trouble now, uh, partly because there was this liquidity thing that they have this new access to the capital market. Uh, we view that, in fact, as a, a, a very good uh, development. Many people thought of that as a better reallocation of capital and so on and so forth. And we miss completely the fact that we were creating that on the basis of something that had very weak basis, and we didn't have the structure to sustain it. We thought, and this has been said several times in this panel, that the capital market was going to be our friend. That was a lesson that they could have learned from emerging markets. Uh, but they felt, actually I discussed that in Europe uh, before the crisis, and it was very clear that uh, many economies, very central banks said, well, this is very different because we have the ECB and so on and so forth, and it's a matter of just uh, issuing a little bit of liquidity and everything would be fine. Uh, obviously, that we are not there. So, uh, Francesco uh, brought up the case of, of Greece, and I guess uh, uh, your question was partly if they had met the Maastricht uh, conditions, for example, would, we, would they be out of, of this problem? I, I don't think so, because Spain uh, met those conditions and uh, the, uh, the over indebtedness uh, took place in the private sector, not in the public sector. Now they have nationalized much of that and probably they will do in that in, in the future. So I see that as a result of this new access to, to credit with a, a sort of very, ba very uh, weak uh, institutional basis uh, at, at the heart. Plus the fact that we, and sometimes this, this is not brought uh, uh, to the fore uh, as uh, clearly as it should, that there were new instruments that have been created like mortgage-backed securities that uh, made transfers and credit to certain sectors that, that, like real estate much easier. Uh, and that's why the cost of doing that went down and that can partly explain the, 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 the real estate uh, a boom that uh, obviously collapsed when all of these instruments were, were attacked. So there is an element here that uh, is not just crazy over indebtedness, uh, just taking advantage of a, a, a certain condition, because, I mean, there are two, it takes two to, to tango, right, as we know uh, from the South. Uh, and uh, and uh, so Greece uh, or uh, was able to get uh, credit at very low rates. Uh, what, what, what were the banks thinking? Uh, and uh, there was this issue of liquidity, if you want to give it that, that name, trust, that, that had probably very little to do with Greece, uh, but with something else. So in this, uh, I think it's a message that politicians should uh, uh, get uh, often so that they they get uh, uh, the, uh, the into action without thinking that uh, in bailing out a country or bailing uh, you are, or economy, you are really uh, giving away something that they, they don't uh, deserve. Now, there were some questions uh, connected with that. One is about uh, money supply, money supply absorption. It depends on how you think about it. I mean, that could be a problem. But if you, if you take a look at the chart that I showed uh, very briefly here, uh, where safe assets seem to have contracted by about 30%. Uh, indeed, it's a study by uh, Barclays uh, uh, based on a work by, by Gordon, an economist in, in Yale, and they define a concept which is safe assets, very close to liquid assets, and they claim that uh, there was a contraction of 30%, and then they look at how that supply of safe assets will increase if the deficit continued at the present levels in the EU and in, in the United States, and which would create more of those assets. And you still find that after, I don't know, 10 more years, you are still below the levels that they have achieved in 2000 and before 2008. Well, that's an issue for, for further... For what, further are they, what happens when they find out the safe assets aren't safe? Well, that's even worse. That's exactly what happened. That's why the, if they are, it, 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 I don't have an answer to that. But the issue is, well, so that the possibility that uh, there will be an unraveling uh, is there. 
Uh, I don't know where the money is going to go. I mean, don't tell me that it's going to go to gold. It went to gold, but that's not uh, good enough for, for a means of payment in a regular economy to the extent that prices are set in terms of dollars or set in terms of euros. Now, if we change over to a system where prices are set in terms of gold, then the dollar and the euro will be in trouble. So it's on the, those, that's my opinion, my humble opinion. But in any case, so the, the issue is certainly, there is an issue that uh, the, the, some of those uh, expansions may have to be unraveled. If they have, in the, one answer that I would have looking at this evidence is uh, maybe they don't have for a long time. So I, say, I think it's something that is worth considering. But if they have, then it's going to be a mess. Because it's not going to happen just uh, in, a, in an orderly fashion. I mean, somebody will invent something all of a sudden, and we will shift to a new system. Now, what is the Fed thinking these days? Well, they want to pay interest on reserves. Well, once again, emerging markets are a good example, especially Argentina and Brazil. They tried that. And that was the case of death, because if you have a, a fiscal problem and you start paying interest on money, then you are dead in the water. Uh, so, and if this happens very sudden and there's a lack of trust, a lack of trust in the currency, then, then you're in real trouble. So I, if, if unraveling sh should take place, I think it's going to be very complicated. Thank you. We have just the time for one or two questions. Any? There is a hand up there. Up. In the meanwhile, let me just ask a, a very quick question. Uh, Oh, no, you're right. So, imagining a world in which indeed we create the European safe asset, like Guillermo talks, and we integrate the banks the way um, Lorenzo talks, and we do the political union and allow for the fiscal transfers, like Ken asks for, we'd still left with an underlying problem in Europe of very large productivity differences. Since 2000, unit labor costs in Germany grew 30% less than in Portugal or Spain. But that's actually not a problem of the euro. It's not a problem of integration of capital markets. If you look between 1990 and 2000, you, ha you see exactly the same pattern of just very divergent productivity growth and unit labor costs in Europe. Is it, do we have an answer on how to even have a currency union? Going back to the optical currency union, but now from the real perspective, when we have 20, 30 year old and long and perhaps even more productivity differences across different regions that require real exchange rate adjustments, and that will lead to crisis under floating rates, as we had in the 80s and 90s, and to crisis under a fixed rate or under a single currency with debt and so on, as we had in the 2000s. But how do we handle an optical currency area when we have 30 years long of just very large productivity differences systematically across regions? We have two Italians here who have lived with the system for more than 100 years, so maybe they can answer. No, but it seems to me that, I mean, that's an academic issue that you can have two parts of a monetary union with divergent uh, productivity growth rates, which are, can be sustainable to the extent that wages grow in a different pace, which is much more difficult to accept within a country if you have the same union. So that's not sustainable in a country like Italy, maybe, where you have systematic fiscal transfers. It may be more uh, acceptable, say, between Italy and Germany, but only to the extent that wages in Italy don't follow wages in Germany, but they follow the productivity. Um, so I, I don't know if this is consistent from an academic point of view or from, from an analytical point of view, but I, I, it seems to me that this would be a problem only if we start having uh, European unions negotiating wages. But if, if the labor markets remain segmented, you just need the discipline of, um, which is not easy because uh, uh, unions in the south may be uh, going to look at what happens in the north, but, but to the extent that you have a lower w rate of growth of, of, of wages, that's sustainable, I think. Let me just add, I don't know, uh, I just make an observation. When we look at the inflation differentials after the euro, creation of the euro, uh, Greece is 21% relative to Germany, Portugal and Spain is 15%, and Italy is 8%. I could not find any 
uh, equally large inflation differential for any state in the US, except Arizona for some reason, I don't know why. <laughs> so I implicit in this is, first of all, I think it's not, it's cl not clear to me that productivity differentials in the United States may not drift apart, but they never translate into such imbalances in prices that we observe from a typical, as you can even say, the typical problem of the exchange rate-based stabilization. That in, in, I don't know what you were thinking in the ECB when, uh, uh, granted that the credit risk was underestimated everywhere in the world, but uh, w when we live for many, many years with such a low in interest differential, with such uh, different dynamics in prices, I don't know whether there were, you know, you must have had some, some bell ringing, no, no alarm. Uh, to, to be frank, I think that was a discussion with finance ministers. We were bringing this chart with unit labor cost divergences, but there were just simply no, mm, there were no reactions. Uh, uh, and they, they were saying, it's not a problem yet. I mean, politicians are used to solve problems. If it's, unless it becomes a problem, they, they don't see it. So only when they saw it, they realized that this was, uh, was a real problem. Uh, on top of that, when you looked at Spain, it's true that Spain was um, uh, um, losing competitiveness and so on and so forth, but it was you know, the fastest growing economy with budget balance, so everything was fine. How could you go to Spain and say you're doing something wrong? That's, that's, that's not the way politicians think. They were doing everything right. Now they realize that that's what not the case, and maybe this is a lesson, I think, for, for future generations, that you have also to work in good times, not only in bad times, uh, to maintain the discipline. We have 30 seconds left, so you want to use them? Uh, I was just going to mention that uh, for the euro area, it would be very difficult for, uh, for a regular country that pegs to, uh, to a currency without uh, a Maastricht-type uh, arrangement uh, uh, there are things that you can do from the fiscal side, real devaluations that uh, do not require devaluing the, the currency and can help out uh, in, in the transition. Now, and, uh, but uh, I, I would say that let's be careful not to extrapolate what we have seen in the area as something that is likely to happen in the future because I think what ha we have seen is this, this massive transfer of funds to uh, certain uh, regions in the area because of the development of new financial instruments. If we are careful with that, maybe we can avoid some of the problem before they start. Okay. It's now one o'clock. We should uh, join uh, you know, a big round of applause to thank our... our And I'm sure we'll not uh, pose it any threat to the UK banking system where many of you will go ahead and uh, divide up uh, your joint account with your current partners. <laughs> <laughs>